So, uh, so without further ado, uh, you heard Jenny say that I'm a breast radiologist in Vancouver, and I'm very happy to be speaking to you today about breast cancer basics and uh, what you need to know about screening. So here are my disclosures. I'm here on a volunteer basis. I have no relevant financial conflicts. So today I'll explain what breast cancer is and what signs you can look for. I'm gonna stress the benefits of early detection and tell you how to increase the likelihood of finding cancer earlier if you do get it. I'll explain what dense breasts are and why it's critical for you to know if your breasts are dense. And as we go through, I'm gonna point out some common myths about breast cancer. So starting with the basics. Breast cancer is a disease where a group of cells loses the normal control and they grow usually into a lump and they invade and they damage the surrounding normal breast tissue. They can spread to other parts of the body like lymph nodes and other organs, but important, breast cancer is not life-threatening when it's just in the breast. It's when it spreads that it can kill. And many cancers can be found before this spread happens and when they can be more easily treated. So who gets breast cancer? Anyone, almost any age. Breast cancer is very uncommon, but still occurs in the 20s and 30s. And even men can get breast cancer, although it's uncommon. So myth number one, I sadly sometimes hear from young women that they didn't see their doctor when they found a lump in their breast because they assumed that they were too young to get breast cancer. And even women who do see their doctor are sometimes dismissed because the doctor thinks they're too young. And unfortunately, that's not true. Having said that, most lumps are not breast cancer, but when you find a lump, you should get it checked because as I say, it can occur in pretty much any age. Now you've probably heard that one in eight women get breast cancer, but that's not uniform across all ages. Risk increases as women age. The risk for a 20 year old woman to get breast cancer in the next 10 years is one in 1700, but risk jumps dramatically in the 40s. For a 40 year old woman, it's one in 69. And that's why we should all have mammograms starting at 40, but especially black, Asian and Hispanic women who tend to get breast cancer younger than white women. Their peak incidence is in the mid 40s compared to white women whose peak is in the late 50s and early 60s. Now there are many factors that can increase a woman's risk of getting breast cancer above average. Some are beyond our control, like the ones listed on the left, like having one of the breast cancer genes, having had chest radiation for lymphoma before age 30, having dense breast tissue, Jewish women whose ancestors came from Eastern Europe, having a previous biopsy that showed atypical cells, if you started your periods younger than average or went through menopause later, or if you had no children. Those are all things that increase a woman's breast cancer risk. But the list on the right is a list of factors that you can control to reduce your risk. Minimizing the use of combined hormone therapy after menopause can reduce risk. So can a low fat diet, minimal or no alcohol, moderate exercise, not smoking and maintaining a healthy body weight. No one likes to hear about the role of alcohol in breast cancer. Uh, but you may be aware that there were old studies that showed that moderate alcohol intake induces, sorry, reduces heart attack risk. But that's myth number two. We've known for some time that even small amounts of alcohol, and that's wine, um, beer, or spirits, are linked to several types of cancer. The new recommendations that came out just a couple of months ago are that more than two drinks a week is risky. Now, some people think that's too conservative, but we know that three to six drinks a week increases the risk of developing cancers, including breast cancer and colorectal cancers. More than seven drinks a week also increases the risk of heart disease and stroke. So please don't think that a glass of wine every night with dinner is harmless. But if you need persuading, here's some more information. Even just a drink a day increases the risk of a variety of other cancers. It can also damage the digestive system, the liver, the heart, brain, immune system. It can leave men impotent and it can reduce fertility and sex drive in women. So here's another myth. Some women tell me that they don't need to worry about breast cancer because no one in their family has had it. And although it's true that the risk of breast cancer is higher in women with a family history, especially in a mother, sister, or daughter, women and even sometimes doctors are surprised to learn that 80 to 85% of women who get breast cancer have no family history. That's why all women need to be screened, not just those at increased risk. The most significant risk factors for getting breast cancer are one, being a woman, and two, growing older. And among women diagnosed with breast cancer, dense breasts are a more frequent situation than having a family history. 
So I'll discuss dense breasts in detail later. Now there are tools online to calculate a woman's risk of getting breast cancer. And this one is for women who haven't had cancer. And it gives the result of the estimate of the risk coming in the next 10 years and over a lifetime. It's easy to use with just a few questions and women with a lifetime risk greater than 25% are regarded as very high risk. Now you can Google IBIS risk calculator and calculate your own risk. And by the way, because we're recording this lecture, I'll send it all to Robin and she can share it with you later so you don't have to take notes or write down any of these references. Now, we wanna find breast cancer as early as possible but it would be even better if we could prevent it from happening. If girls followed a healthy lifestyle starting in childhood, it's thought that most breast cancers could be prevented. Even if women wait until middle age to make changes in their lifestyle, it's thought that as many as half of all breast cancers could be prevented. For example, walking 30 minutes a day can lower breast cancer risk by 20%. Breastfeeding for a year, and that includes all children, not each one, lowers risk by 20%. An overweight woman who loses 10 pounds decreases her risk by 10% and loss of 20 pounds lowers risk by 50%. So myth number four is that breast cancer always shows up as a lump. Well, it can show up as a lump, but not always. And it's important to remember that most lumps are not cancer. Cancer can show up in many other ways listed here, like an area that feels firmer than the tissue around it or dimpling on the skin or crust from discharge on the nipple warmth or redness, sores on the skin. Discharge from the nipple isn't always cancer. In fact, if it's white, yellow, or green, it's not suspicious. But if it comes out without squeezing and it's clear like water or bloody, it should be checked. Now, a nipple that's pulled in can be normal, especially if it's been like that for a long time. But if it's new, it should be checked. And if the skin gets thick and dimpled like the skin of an orange, that should be promptly checked. This photo is from a website called Know Your Lemons. It shows some of the ways breast cancer can manifest. They also have an app and you should try to have a look at it. It's knowyourlemons.org. So I've covered the risk factors, suggestions that might prevent cancer, and now how to recognize possible breast cancer when it's visible or feelable. The next section is about early detection of breast cancer before it's big enough to feel or see. So we do screening to find cancer early, sometimes years before it can be felt as a lump or seen as dimpling, et cetera. When cancer is found and treated earlier, significant numbers of lives are saved. But another important reason to try to find cancer earlier is so it can be successfully treated less aggressively than would be necessary if it's detected at a more advanced stage. And that means a better quality of life for women with cancer. By less aggressive surgery, I mean the option for less aggressive breast surgery, like lumpectomy instead of mastectomy, the option for less armpit surgery, and the option to avoid chemotherapy, all of which obviously improve quality of life. When cancer is detected early, mastectomy is usually, sorry, when it's detected later, mastectomy like you see here is usually required. But when found early, more women can have a lumpectomy with a great cosmetic outcome. Lymphedema is a condition where there's swelling in the arm and hand, from blockage of the lymphatic vessels in the armpit. And it's a common side effect of the traditional armpit surgery done for lymph node staging when a woman's diagnosed with breast cancer. It's usually permanent. When cancer is detected early, women can have a less invasive procedure called a sentinel node biopsy with a much lower risk of lymphedema. And women deserve the opportunity to avoid this complication. Chemotherapy, of course, is challenging to go through, and some women even suffer long-term complications. But nowadays, many women can avoid chemotherapy if their cancer is small, if there are no positive nodes in the armpit, and if they're determined to be at low risk of recurrence. So this is another important reason to find cancers early. And remember, early detection saves lives. The five-year survival drops when the stage of diagnosis is more advanced. The overall five-year survival from breast cancer, all, all in, is 87%. But when women are diagnosed at what we call stage zero or one, it's virtually 100%. 100% of women are still alive five years later. And fortunately, about 65% of women are diagnosed at those stages. But even with new and better treatments, five-year survival is only about 23% when a cancer is diagnosed at stage four. 
and about 6% of women with breast cancer are diagnosed when they're already stage four. Now, there are many different tests that can be used to screen for cancer, and I'm going to discuss these in more detail shortly. Breast self-examination and clinical breast exams by doctors and nurse practitioners, believe it or not, are currently discouraged. I'll explain later why I'm a big proponent of self-exams. But please know, and you may have heard of this test, thermography. Thermography has been discredited and should not be used for screening according to the FDA and Health Canada. It can find big cancers close to the skin, but it misses smaller cancers deeper in the breast, and it has a very high rate of false alarms. The term breast self-exam has gone out of fashion, and women are told to be breast aware and told to see their doctor if they notice any change. But how's a woman supposed to know if there's been a change if she doesn't know what her breasts normally feel like? And to complicate matters, there's not one normal for all women. Some women's breasts feel soft and uniform. Others normally feel lumpy like a bag of marbles. Some feel like solid concrete, but some, no two women's breasts are identical. But when a woman does breast self-exam, she quickly becomes familiar with her normal texture and she's more likely to notice a subtle change than any healthcare professional who examines perhaps more than a dozen women each day, but might only examine her once a year. There are lots of demonstrations on how to do a good breast self-exam on YouTube, but an excellent one I recommend, you're gonna get this slide later, don't, don't write it down, is by Dr. Liz O'Reardon. She's a breast cancer surgeon in the UK and she's had breast cancer. So please check it out, it's only three minutes long. Um, that's the first link you see. The second link is for women who've had a mastectomy, how to examine their chest wall. So here's how a mammogram is done for those of you who haven't had the pleasure. Each breast is compressed twice and only for a few seconds, once from top to bottom and once on an angle from side to side. And a low dose X-ray is taken in each position. The compression is uncomfortable, but it should not be excruciating. And that compression is necessary for two reasons. One, to spread out the tissue to make cancers easier to spot and to reduce the radiation required for penetration of the tissue. If you're still having periods, try to schedule your mammogram appointment when you're just finishing or soon after your period, because for most women, that's when the breast should be the least sensitive. Now, here's another myth. Some women think that they can't have a mammogram because they have breast implants. That's not true. Mammograms are also safe and recommended for women with implants. The technologist takes the usual pictures and then special pictures with the implant carefully pushed back out of the way so that we can get better compression on the woman's own breast tissue. Now, I know radiation is a concern for some of you, but believe it or not, it's not a concern for experts because the dosage has come down so low over the decades. The radiation risk from a mammogram is primarily in women less than 20 years old, and we would not do mammography on young women. The radiation risk is negligible after age 40. Now, you may not know this, but we're all exposed to natural source radiation every day from the air, the water, and the ground. The radiation dose from a mammogram is similar to the natural radiation you re you'd receive in seven weeks if you live at sea level like we do in Vancouver. Natural rate source radiation is higher at higher elevations. So you sometimes hear that the dose of a mammogram is similar to the total dose of taking five transatlantic flights. And flight attendants are exposed to that uh, radiation as uh, occupationally. Now, the mortality rate for breast cancer in Canada had been unchanged for decades. But after screening started in, the, in about 1988, the blue line here shows that breath, breast cancer deaths plummeted. There have been estimated 32,000 fewer breast cancer deaths than expected since 1986, which is convincing confirmation of the safety and success of screening and, and treatment. In this study, they obtained data on almost 2.8 million women in Canada and compared the women having mammograms to the women not having mammograms. And they showed that overall, women who have mammograms are 40% less likely to die of breast cancer than those who don't. And women aged 40 to 49 are 44% less likely to die. So this shows the importance of starting to have screening mammograms at age 40. Now, unfortunately, only four provinces in Canada allow women to self-refer starting at 40, but happily, BC is one of the, those. And that's, if you live in British Columbia and you're a woman, you should be taking advantage uh, that we're so lucky to be able to uh, refer ourselves from mammography. 
These are the current guidelines from some of the organizations in Canada. And screening is not recommended by the Canadian Task Force on Preventive Healthcare until age 50. I just told you we should start at 40. BC and three other provinces start at 40 because they know the studies that support it. These conflicting guidelines did not arise because of different facts. They arose because of different value judgments applied to the same facts. Now, annual mammography starting at age 40 saves the most lives. And this is recognized even by the task force and other organizations that re recommend starting later or screening less often. They know that their guidelines will lead to more avoidable deaths. So I wanna look at this in more detail because even if you're not in your 40s, you can share this critical information with daughters, other family members, friends, and colleagues. Here's why it's important to start at 40. One in six breast cancers, or 17%, are diagnosed to women in their 40s. And cancer grows faster in younger premenopausal women, which explains why, even though uh, only 17, only 17% 17 of women of uh, cancers occur in that age group, 27% of the years of life lost to breast cancer occur to women diagnosed in their 40s. The most years of life are saved when women have mammograms every year starting at 40. Cancer is uncommon younger than 40, but it does happen. The incidence jumps, as I told you, at age 40, and it increases with increasing age. Now, the increase declines after 70 because as women get older, they start dying of other causes like heart disease and other cancers. But if a woman doesn't die of another disease, her own risk of breast cancer keeps climbing. Women in their 40s, I don't have to tell you, are often caring for young children and aging parents. They're working and contributing to the economy. They have the most potential years of life to lose. And although cancer is less common in these younger women, it does grow faster. So it's especially important that these women get screened. But shockingly, even though women don't need a requisition in BC to have a mammogram, only 25% of eligible women are having mammograms. I, and I hope if you're one of them, I'll persuade you to start. So when should screening stop? Many women mistakenly think that they don't need mammograms as they get older, but I just told you breast cancer keeps increasing with increasing age. And if you don't die of something else, your risk of breast cancer keeps climbing. Many organizations recommend that if a woman's in good health with a life expectancy of 10 years, then it's worth continuing screening to find those cancers when they're small. An individual woman's decision to continue screening should be based on her health, her life expectancy, and her values. Please share this information with your loved ones who are 65, 75, and older. From Statistics Canada, the average life expectancy for a 75-year-old woman is 13 years. At age 80, it's 10 years. So stopping at age 80 would be reasonable, but it depends on general health and so on. I have a friend who's 84 and extremely active. She just bought an outdoor bike last year and she rides 10K three times a week and she is still having mammograms. So in seven provinces, women can continue to self-refer past age 74. And again, BC is one of them. So we're lucky to be in BC. Now, the biggest obstacle to optimal screening in Canada is the Canadian Task Force on Preventive Healthcare. They're a federally funded panel that it makes screening guide guidelines in Canada for breast, prostate, and other cancers, and for other health concerns. And they send their guidelines to all of the family doctors and nurse practitioners in Canada. The panel making breast cancer screening guidelines had, you ready for this? No breast cancer experts. The panel making breast cancer screening guidelines had no breast cancer experts, so they made a number of errors. And they decided that what they called the harms of screening outweighed the benefits. So here are their recommendations. They say that, and these apply, by the way, only to women who haven't had cancer. They say that for women at average risk, that they recommend not screening in the 40s. And that's dangerous because as I told you, breast cancer risk is increasing in younger women and it grows faster. They recommend screening women age 50 to 74 only every two to three years. Waiting two years instead of one gives cancers more time to grow before they're found and every three years is worse. The task force recommends that family doctors and nurse practitioners not do breast exams and they recommend that women should not do breast self exams. But given that mammograms save lives and improve the quality of life for women, you might wonder, how could they arrive at these guidelines? 
Well, they say that in their estimation, the harms of screening outweigh the benefits. Harms? What harms could they be that they out, out, outweigh, you know, saving lives and, and increasing the quality of life? Well, the harm they're most concerned about is the anxiety that women experience if they get called back from screening for more tests, what, what should be called a fal false alarm. And false alarms happen with all screening tests like pap smears. These recalls certainly do cause anxiety, but it's short-lived and it's been shown to be reduced if women are informed about the possibility ahead of time. So that's what I'm doing today. I'm telling you that if you go for a mammogram and you get called back, don't panic because most of the people who are called back will not have cancer when they finish their investigations. So we should ask the task force, how many women is it okay to die unnecessarily to spare a handful of women some transient anxiety? In this comic, the task force member is saying, yes, regular mammograms and early detection would have saved your life, but aren't you glad we spared you all that anxiety? The task force thinks it's more important to save women anxiety, even though they know that more women, especially young women, will die. It's patronizing and condescending. Women can tolerate some transient anxiety and they should be able to decide for themselves whether they wanna be screened and have the opportunity for early detection. The women I see who are the most anxious are those who find out that they have cancer and that it, it may have spread to their lymph nodes and that it could have been found earlier. They are anxious and justifiably angry. In fact, the cutoff age of age 50 has no scientific basis as a threshold for screening. Please share this information with your friends, family, and colleagues in their 40s. Another risk of screening is called overdiagnosis. It's tough to explain because it's theoretical. It's a theoretical possibility that a woman will be diagnosed and treated for cancer, but that she might die of something else before her breast cancer would have become life-threatening, like heart disease or a different cancer or even being in a car accident. The task force, because they used the wrong studies to come to their conclusions, uh, thought that around half of all cancers are, are overdiagnosed, but that's ridiculous. Um, most experts agree that the overdiagnosis ranges from 1% to 10% and probably in the lower end of that range, especially for younger women, because they don't have other cancers and other diseases uh, as often as older women. So it makes no sense to deny women the opportunity to find potentially lethal cancers to avoid hypothetical overdiagnosis. So this is what your doctor and nurse practitioner um, have been told by the task force. And you need to know if, you're, if they tell you not to go for a mammogram, why they're saying it. So if you don't have a crystal ball, and if you don't know that you're gonna be killed in a car accident or have a fatal heart attack in the next couple of years, mammography is a good bet. Now, although mammograms are important, they're not perfect. One way they aren't perfect is the false alarms, finding things that aren't cancer. For example, a woman might be called back after her screening mammogram, and it turns out that it's just a cyst. But another way they aren't perfect is that mammograms don't find all cancers. Women with dense breasts and women uh, who are at higher than average risk, including breast cancer survivors and those with the genetic mutations like the BRCA genes, they need other screening in addition to mammograms. So now I'm gonna detail some of the tests besides mammograms, and I'll explain them in the context of dense breasts. The best way to explain breast density is with pictures. Dense tissue is the main reason that breast cancers can be missed on a mammogram. Now this picture is an obvious cancer in a 55 year old woman who came for a screening mammogram. Um, the reason I'm 100% sure that this is cancer is because it has irregular jaggedy edges and you may be able to see there's some very tiny little white dots which are malignant calcifications. Now this cancer is really easy to see because the cancer is always white and this woman's breast otherwise is dark gray and the dark gray tissue is fat. So I want you to just remember what this cancer looks like for the next few slides. This woman's breasts are almost entirely fat and fat is dark gray on a mammogram. If she had that cancer from a few slides ago, we'd have no trouble seeing it in her fatty breasts. These breasts are also normal, but you can see there, there's a little bit more white stuff. They're not all dark gray. And the white tissue is what normal breast tissue can look like. If she had that cancer from a few slides ago, we'd have a good chance of seeing it in her breasts. But these breasts are normal too, and they have even more normal dense tissue. It becomes harder to see cancers, which are white in a background of white. We might see a cancer in her breasts if it developed up here, 
but it, it would be masked. It would be hiding in her normal dish, dense tissue would hap, if it happened to develop there. And in some women, there's no fat. Even a large cancer can be missed. In fact, mammograms miss up to 50% of women, uh, sorry, 50% of cancers in women who have breasts that look like these, which we call extremely dense. Now, radiologists divide breast density into four categories, A through D. And look at how different these breasts look. And they're all normal. They range from all fat to all dense. And the denser the breast, the more likely that a cancer will be missed. I should also tell you that breasts are unique because in every other organ in the body, a normal organ looks the same. A normal brain looks the same on a test, normal liver and kidneys and so on. But these breasts looking so different are all normal. Now this video is going to show you that a tiny cancer can be missed the denser the breast is. So you can see how a small cancer that we could see easily in a fatty breast could be completely missed in a dense breast. Now you can't tell if you have dense breasts by the size of your breasts or by touch. And your doctor can't tell by a physical exam because both fatty and dense tissue can feel soft, it can feel firm, or it can feel lumpy. Breast density can only be determined by a mammogram, either by the radiologist using just looking at it or by software. But only about 60% of eligible women are having mammograms. So those who are not having mammograms cannot find out their density. And as I told you, only about 25% of women in their 40s who are eligible to go are going. So we need, we need more women to go and that's how they're gonna find out if they're dense. Now, dense breasts, as I just said, they're normal and they're common. In fact, more than 40% of women over the age of 40 have dense breasts. But women need to know if they have dense breasts so they can understand the implications. Now, until 2018, no women in Canada, no women in Canada were being told their breast density. But that changed thanks to Dense Breast Canada. You met Jenny if you were on at the very beginning of the webinar. Dense Breast Canada is a not profit education and advocacy group. And thanks to the tireless work of Jenny and their volunteers, there are now six Canadian provinces and territories that inform all women of their breast density. And BC was the first one. Four more have committed to starting in the coming months. The only way to find out if you have densis, dense breasts is by having a mammogram. And when you do, when you have a screening mammogram, you will get a copy of the report mailed to you and your density information is included in that results letter. When a cancer is not detected on a mammogram, what happens? It continues to grow and potentially spread. Now, usually these are found as a lump and we call them interval cancers because they were found in the interval between planned screening mammograms. Interval cancers tend to be larger and more often already spread to the lymph nodes than cancers that we find at screening. They tend to be more aggressive and women with interval cancers have a worse prognosis than women whose cancers are found on screening mammograms. Women with the densest breast, that category D, are 13 to 18 times more likely to have an interval cancer than women with fatty breasts, and they have worse outcomes. We need to be better at finding cancers earlier in those women, and we can. So the biggest risk of having dense breasts is that cancers aren't seen on the mammogram, but here's the double whammy. The denser the breast, the greater the risk of getting breast cancer. Women with the densest breasts are four to six times more likely to get breast cancer than women with fatty breasts, or they're about double the risk of women with average density. Having dense breasts is the most prevalent risk factor for getting breast cancer, even more so than having a family history. So this study from the Netherlands showed that women with non-dense tissue who have mammograms reduce their risk of dying by 41%. But women with non-dense breasts who reduce, but women, sorry, with dense breasts only reduce their risk of dying by 13%. So said another way, women with dense breasts are discriminated against if they only have access to mammograms for breast cancer screening, because we can find many of the cancers when they're small with supplemental screening and prevent them from becoming interval cancers. So let's look at how we can do that. We've known for over 25 years that ultrasound can find many of the cancers that are missed on mammograms when they're still small and haven't spread to the lymph nodes. Our study in 1995 was the first to prove that. I found three cancers per thousand exams, cancers that were missed on their mammograms and many subsequent studies showed the same results. BC started covering screening breast ultrasound 
with provincial health insurance for women with category C and D densities in 2019. Now my 1995 paper showed three cancers per thousand ultrasound screens. But in the first year since insurance coverage started in 2019, our clinic's cancer detection rate was seven per thousand. We more than doubled it by doing screening ultrasound. They were all small and none of them had spread to the lymph nodes. 40% of the cancers we found were in women with no family history and 60% were in category C. So ideally all women with category C and D should have access. Look at your screening mammography report and find out if you're category C or D. Now compared to other tests, ultrasound is relatively inexpensive. It doesn't need an intravenous, it doesn't use radiation, and it even uses minimal pressure. So it's, it's popular among patients. Ultrasound finds small cancers missed on mammograms and it reduces interval cancers. Women with dense breasts sometimes ask me if they can skip the mammogram and just have the ultrasound. The short answer is no. Mammograms can see some cancers that are missed on ultrasound. And ultrasound usually can see calcifications, like we saw in that very first cancer I showed you, that can sometimes be the first sign of an early cancer. Calcifications are very common in breast tissue, and they can be benign or malignant. And there's overlap in how they look. So whenever we're less than 98% sure it, that it's not cancer, we recommend a biopsy. Now, some of the other tests that can find cancers missed on mammograms, one of them is digital breast tomosynthesis or TOMO for short, sometimes called 3D mammography. It's not a separate test, it's just a better mammogram. And it addresses the two weaknesses of mammography. It finds more cancers than regular 2D mammography and it reduces the recalls from screening, the false alarms. It's rapidly uh, replacing 2D mammography in the United States, but it's not used for screening in Canada, except in Alberta. MRI has been uh, used for women at very high risk uh, since 2007. It finds the most cancers missed on mammograms with the highest detection rate of 10 to 16 per thousand in the first round. It uses no radiation and it's been proven to reduce interval cancers and late stage disease. The downsides are that it requires an intravenous. Claustrophobia is an issue for some women because standard MRI requires about 45 minutes in the magnet. In two large studies of MRI, only about 40% of the women who were offered the MRI agreed to have it, and that's because it's not as well tolerated. In general, it can't be done in women with pacemakers or other implants, and it's very expensive, and access is inadequate in most of Canada. It's used to screen women at very high risk, like the women with the breast cancer gene, and in some other special circumstances. But there is now a faster way of doing breast MRI that's gradually being taken up everywhere, but it's not, it's not universal. Instead of the conventional scan take that takes 45 minutes, this one requires only 10 minutes in the scanner and it's faster for the radiologist to read. That's going to make it less expensive and it should make it more tolerable for women with claustrophobia, but it still requires an intravenous. Uh, a contrast enhanced mammogram is another new excellent test. It's a mammogram done after an intravenous injection, and it has a similar cancer detection rate to breast MRI. It's a reasonable alternative to MRI for women who would otherwise qualify for it, but can't get it or can't tolerate it. And it's fast. Uh, once the IV is started and the contrast is injected, it takes about seven minutes to take all the pictures. There are a couple of blood tests uh, available and they're being widely advertised. We sometimes call them liquid biopsies. Um, some companies are marketing them directly to the public to screen for breast and other cancers. Now, the research studies so far are small, and so far they're incomplete, so please be skeptical. This test may eventually prove to be a game changer, but it's too early to judge, so don't spend your money. So starting to wind up, what, what should you do if you find out that you have dense breasts? Absolutely continue having mammograms because they can detect cancers that aren't visible on ultrasound. Do regular breast self-exams between screening. And here's why. Doing breast self-exam, especially in women with dense breasts, can be the difference between women being diagnosed at stage one or later. Uh, remember I said that um, I showed you the websites where you can learn how to do breast self-exam. And most interval cancers are diagnosed because the woman felt a lump. Now, sometimes it's an accidental breast self-examination. The women didn't set out to do breast self-exam, but she just happened to notice in the shower that, hey, wait a minute, what's that I'm feeling? But if you do deliberate breast self-examination, and it doesn't have to be every month, 
you might increase the likelihood if you're unlucky enough to get breast cancer, you might increase the likelihood that you'll find it earlier. Don't let it wait till two years till your next mammogram. Any woman with category C or D dense should have at least supplemental ultrasound, but your doctor or nurse practitioner might not know about it. Now you do need a requisition from them in British Columbia for it to be covered by MSP. So be prepared to advocate for yourself. There aren't many places doing it, so you may have to wait. We recommend that the mammogram and ultrasound not be done at the same time. Rather, the ultrasound should be done halfway between planned mammograms, so you're being screened twice as often. Now, that can help detect uh, rapidly growing cancer sooner. You should speak to your doctor about your level of breast density, excuse me, <laughs> the associated risks, any additional risk factors that you have, and the best screening options for you. If you do the IBIS risk assessment tool and you find that you have a greater than 25% lifetime risk, you may qualify for referral to a high risk clinic and be eligible for more supplemental screening, like with MRI instead of ultrasound. So it's important to be prepared and informed. And there are tips for you how to have a conversation with your doctor on the websites densebreastscanada.ca and mybreastscreening.ca. Don't write it down, you're going to get it later. So here are the takeaways. Some cancers are not detectable on mammograms. Most abnormalities on mammograms are not cancer. And women who have mammograms are 40 plus percent less likely to die of breast cancer than women who don't. The benefits of screening outweigh the harms. If you're 40 or over or older and you have been putting off having a screening mammogram, please go and you'll find out your breast density on your report. Ultrasound can find many cancers that are missed on mammograms and dense breasts, and there are two risks to having dense breasts. Number one, the risk that the mammogram could miss a cancer, and number two, the risk of having breast cancer increases just because you've got dense breasts. So it's important to know your density and understand those implications. I didn't have time to go through all the myths on breast cancer, but you'll see this when you get the recording. Optimal screening means annual mammograms for all average risk women starting at age 40. You don't need a requisition in BC. Please make your appointment. And as long as you're in good health with a life expectancy of 7 to 10 years, you should know your breast density and keep going for screening mammograms. As an individual, please prioritize your health and seek optimal screening. Please let me know. Please let me know if you know of other opportunities for me to give a complimentary webinar to any other companies or women's groups. Educate your friends, families, and coworkers. Share this webinar with them. You can send them the recording when you get it from Robin. Learn more, including on how to speak to your doctor about optimal screening on mybreastscreening.ca. And if you've had cancer, please consider sharing your story on densebreastcanada.ca. Everything I discussed today can be found in this free guide on densebreastcanada.ca. If you need help advocating for yourself, there's a free toolkit on densebreastcanada.ca. Here are the resources I mentioned today. I'm gonna to send a recording of the webinar to Robin and she can send it to all of you. So please share it. So thanks for your attention. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and see if anybody put any questions in the chat. And if you wanna ask a live question, please go to the reactions button and raise your hand. So the chat. No questions in the chat. I warned that you might be a little bit shy. So please ask questions if you have them. Oh, wait a minute. Do I recommend mastectomy and re reconstruction to a person with a high risk of cancer? That's a good question. And it's, you know, the Angelina Jolie effect. If a woman has a very high risk and women, so the average woman has about a 12% risk of getting breast cancer in her lifetime. But women who have the breast cancer genes are at very high risk, as high as 72% lifetime risk. And if that, if a woman falls into that category, it's, it's, it's not sign up and you're gonna have mastectomies. It's a conversation um, as to what the options are. There are drugs now that can the re reduce the risk of getting breast cancer. But if a woman chooses, yes, she can have uh, both uh, both breasts removed and reconstruction if if they choose. Is breast density type hereditary? Probably not. Um, but but you don't know until you have your mammogram whether you've got dense breasts. So if your mother had dense breasts, it doesn't mean you're going to have dense breasts. Or if your sister had dense breasts, so please go for those mammograms. Uh, Jenny, who can see your messages? All right, that's all the questions so far in the chat, and I don't see anybody raising their hand. I know we don't have 
limitless time. So it's, for, it's almost 45 minutes and I was told that we should wrap up in 45 minutes. I hope you all had, to, had a chance to eat your lunch. So with that, I think we'll stop the recording um, and we will send it to Robin and she can forward it to all of you. Uh, as I said, please, if any of you are involved with any other women's groups, uh, reach out. Um, I, I'm, I'm trying. My, it's my passion to get this information to as many people as possible. And um, the webinars are, are uh, complimentary, no charge. Uh, so don't be shy about about finding other groups. Oh, four new, five new messages. Oh, okay. They're mostly thank yous. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thanks for giving up some of your lunch to to hear this. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Okay, everybody, have a great day. Bye now.